Welcome to chapter 14 of Anatomy and Physiology, where we're continuing through the nervous system. By now, moving on to the brain and looking at nerves coming off the brain called cranial nerves. We're basically going to do the same thing for the brain and cranial nerves, the same thing we did for the spinal cord and spinal nerves. We're going to go through the anatomy, talking about what things look like and what we call them. And we're going to talk about physiology. How does the brain and all the nerves coming off the brain, the cranial ner nerves, nerves, how do they do the functions of the central nervous system? And there are going to be some similarities. Turns out there are going to be some similarity, similarities between the brain and the spinal cord. Starting off with this picture here. We're looking at a, a sagittal section of the brain. And we're looking in and you're noticing right off the bat, there are certain color differences. There are some areas that look darker and some areas that look lighter, almost whitish. Oh, you're just seeing the differences between gray and white matter again. Brain is still nervous tissue. So it still has neurons, some of which are myelinated and some which are not. So in the brain, you're still gonna see some gray matter made up of unmyelinated neurons, and you're gonna see some white matter made up of myelinated neurons. And so you're seeing some of those differences. You're noticing the outer areas, the more superficial areas of the brain look a little darker. You're seeing gray matter, and you're seeing deeper in the brain, the central regions, it looks a little lighter. You're seeing white matter. So you're seeing the brain is a little opposite to the spinal cord. Remember in the, in the spinal cord, the more superficial areas were white matter and the deeper areas were gray matter. It switched for the brain. The outer regions for the brain are gonna be more gray matter and deeper in the brain, you're gonna find white matter. But again, we're gonna have time to go through all the brain. This is just an image kind of highlighting some of the major parts. So we're gonna go through it and kind of make our way to and through the brain. So like usual, we gotta start from the outside. If I wanted to see your brain, I would have to cut through a couple structures because like all your other organs, your brain has protection. So if I wanted to see your brain, yes, I would have to cut through the skin of your scalp. Oh, but then I would have to saw through your skull bones, your cranial bones. And once I peel that back, I'm still not looking at the brain. Like other organs we've seen, the brain has layers of connective tissue providing protection. Very similar to the spinal cord, your brain has meninges. All those same meningeal coverings surrounding the spinal cord are also surrounding the brain. Oh, it's the same ones in the same order. From superficial to deep, remember it's the dura mater, the superficial layer, the outermost layer, in the middle was that spider webish looking layer called the arachnoid mater. And touching the spinal cord, you saw the pia mater. It's the same order for the brain. There's going to be a thick outer layer of connective tissue surrounding the brain called the dura mater, a middle layer called the arachnoid mater, and an innermost layer touching the brain called the pia mater. You'll have to get through that as well. And one more thing, just like the spinal cord, your brain is floating in cerebrospinal fluid. Huh. So just like the spinal cord, you're gonna have to get through lots of protection for the brain. And that's all you're seeing in this image. You're seeing again, a section, a cut section, in this case, a coronal section through the top of the head. And you see, they have to get through the skin of the scalp. You have to saw through the skull bone. Then you have to get through all those meningeal layers. And in this picture, you're seeing the green thick outermost layer. That's the dura mater. You see the middle spider webish looking layer, arachnoid mater. And then you see a little red line touching the surface of the brain. That red line is the pia mater. Same order as around the spinal cord. And then, oh, it gets a little bit more complicated for the brain. Turns out that dura mater in your brain is really big and expansive. It has some extensions, and that's what you're seeing in this picture. I want you to know your three major extensions of your dura mater. There's something called the falx cerebri, tentorium cerebelli, and the falx cerebelli. Those are three extensions of the dura mater. We're gonna go through them one by one.
starting off with with what's called the falk cerebri it's what you see kind of at the top of the uh, of this picture it's what's really going in that what's called the longitudinal fissure of the brain. We'll see that in a little bit. The longitudinal fissure is this deep groove running right down the middle of the brain. And running in that groove is an extension of the dura mater called the uh, falx cerebri. So you really find it between the two halves of your brain, between what we call your cerebral hemisphere. And then there are more extensions of the dura mater. Another extension is found between the two halves of the cerebellum. Again, we will see the cerebellum later. Between the two halves of the cerebellum is the falx cerebelli. So they're kind of giving you a hint in their name where to find them. You find the falx cerebri between the two halves of your cerebrum, between your two cerebral hemispheres. And you find the falx cerebelli between the two halves of the cerebellum. And then there's one more extension of, of the dura mater called the tentorium cerebelli. It's kind of hard to see in the image because it's coming out towards you, uh, more in an X axis plane coming out towards you is, uh, the tentorium cere cerebelli. You find the tentorium cerebelli between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So those are three extensions of the dura mater. One more time. Falk cerebri between the two halves of the brain, between the cerebral hemispheres. There's the falx cerebelli between the two halves of the cerebellum. And then there's the tentorium cerebelli. You find that between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So there's lots of connective tissue around and supporting the brain. It's a very sensitive organ and it's a very important organ because it's controlling a lot of your body, bodily functions. So it's very important to make sure all the cells in your brain, all those neurons are getting all their nutrients uh, and supplies to do what they need to do. So it's very important that you send enough blood to and from the brain. Oh, so we got to talk about it. How do we send blood to and from the brain? Well, of course, it's going to be blood vessels. Uh, so it helps to think about some cardiovascular system. If you can name some blood vessels, uh, like the ones in your neck, for example, are called your common carotid arteries. Uh, that's what you're seeing off to the right in red. It's showing some arteries. And in your neck, there's something called the right common carotid artery on the right side of your neck. And there's a left common carotid artery on the left side. That big carotid artery is helping to send some blood with oxygen and nutrients to your brain. But it's not the only blood vessel. Again, look at the image. Oh, you might know another blood vessel if you remember bones. If you remember your vertebral bones, specifically your cervical vertebra. Remember, your, all your cervical vertebra had transverse foramen, those holes on the side. And you remember, in those holes, those transverse foramen was a blood vessel called the vertebral artery. Remember, that artery is also helping to send blood with oxygen and nutrients to the brain. Those are two major blood vessels to help send blood to the brain. The vertebral artery, kind of going through those transverse foramen, and the common carotid arteries in your neck. And then once you drop off the oxygen and nutrients, of course, you're going to have to exchange them for carbon dioxide and waste and take them away. So we need blood vessels to drain blood from the brain. Uh, that's going to be the job of veins. Uh, there's a major vein in your neck that helps. Uh, it's called the jugular veins. Your jugular veins in your neck, you see it in the picture on the left uh, in blue, those are veins in your neck. They're helping to drain the blood and return it to the heart. So that's as far as we're going to go on delivering blood uh, to and from the brain. You'll get more detail when you do cardiovascular system. But just for now, for brain, no, you send blood with blood vessels like the vertebral artery and common carotid arteries and you'll drain blood with blood vessels like the jugular veins and I told you the brain is very sensitive it needs lots of these uh, oxygen and nutrients turns out your brain gets about 20% of your body's oxygen supply 
I know 20% doesn't seem like that much to you, but to your body, 20% is a large amount, especially considering the size of the brain. It's not that large, but it's getting a huge chunk of the oxygen and nutrient supply. Why? Because it's constantly working. Remember, your brain is doing things for you sometimes without you even thinking about it. So it's important for it to constantly get these oxygen and nutrient supplies. Not only oxygen, but nutrients like glucose. Remember, your body uses glucose to help make energy. Your neurons will do that as well. And so if you deprive the body of oxygen and nutrients, you'll see problems with the brain. Just think about it. What will happen if you were to hold your breath too long or if you were to starve yourself of food? Well, you might get a little confused. Think people who uh, might get lost and starve, they'll get a little delirious. You're seeing the body not send enough nutrients to the brain. And if it happens for too long, the brain will shut down and you'll see that as you losing consciousness. Now you know What happens? Now you remember, knowing anatomy helps to explain what happens in real life. But again, back to our brain anatomy. So again, if I wanted to see your brain, I would have to cut through the skin of your scalp, saw through those skull bones, get through those meningeal coverings and a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid, and then what? Huh? What if I was trying to attack it at the microscopic level? There is still more protection for the brain. You know this one too. It's at the microscopic level. You got to think about the cells. Uh, Think about the neuroglial cells. Think about the astrocyte. Remember the astrocyte helped to form what's called the blood-brain barrier. Remember it told you in the name. It's just the barrier between the blood tissue and the brain tissue, and it's created by astrocytes. Uh, Remember that from our tissue lecture. And again, so you have to remember this. This is still here provided protection. Remember, sometimes there are things that could get into the bloodstream, things like infections that you don't want spreading to the brain or or the spinal cord. So they're protected by astrocytes forming a blood-brain barrier. And you remember, if we know anatomy, we could take advantage of it. Maybe you might need a medicine that I need to deliver to the brain. If that's the case, I need to make sure the medicine that I give you could get past this blood-brain barrier. Remember, knowing anatomy helps us to take advantage of it. So those are lots of protections for the brain. So once we get through all these protections, finally, we can look at the brain. And it turns out when we look at inside the brain, it has some empty pockets. It has some, some empty cavities we call ventricles. And they're not necessarily empty. They're not filled with air. They're actually filled with a fluid. The same fluid that's surrounding the brain and spinal cord and providing protection is also found inside the brain and spinal cord. That's cerebrospinal fluid. Why? Well, it's on the outside for protection. You could kind of think your brain is in your skull and your skull is hard bone. If your brain were to completely sit and rest its entire weight on that hard bone, it would kind of collapse under its own weight because your brain has the consistency almost like pudding. So it's almost floating in your skull in the cerebral spinal fluid. And this fluid is inside the brain. Why? This fluid has stuff dissolved in it. Things like oxygen and nutrients. It's helping to provide oxygen and nutrients to the cells as well. And it could even help to remove in some toxic chemicals in certain cases, some, some, some toxins. So this cerebral spinal fluid is providing protection not only from the outside, but also from the inside. So when you cut open the brain, like you see in this picture, they've cut open the brain and you're looking down into it, you see it has some empty pockets. It has ventricles. And inside the ventricles are clusters of ependymal cells helping to make the cerebral spinal fluid. Oh, how are they making it? You can see it in this picture. Off to the right, you see the cluster of ependymal cells and they're lining the pocket. And you see they're almost like they're sitting on a blood vessel. Oh, this helps to explain where they're getting the fluid from. Oh, it's kind of how you would make urine. You're just pulling out the plasma from the blood, minus some of the things dissolved in the plasma. 
that's where you're making cerebrospinal fluid from. Your ependymal cells draw some of that fluid from the plasma, and then they'll dump it into these empty pockets in your brain called ventricles. And we name this cluster of ependymal cells and blood vessels. We name this place in the ventricles where you make cerebrospinal fluid. It's called the choroid plexus. Your choroid plexus is this cluster of ependymal cells and blood vessels. Your choroid plexus is where you're making cerebrospinal fluid. And then once you make it, you're going to circulate it in and around the brain. Oh, so we're going to have to talk about the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. I want you to know the pathway of flow for cerebrospinal fluid. And that's what you see in this image here. Off to the right, they give you a nice, beautiful little flow chart. So you could just memorize that little flow chart. And over to the left, they show you pictures so you could track the flow through the image. So let's take our time and go through it. First up, let's identify those empty pockets in the brain. Let's identify those, those ventricles. Your brain has four major ventricles. It has what we call the lateral ventricles. You have two lateral ventricles, one for each half of your brain, one for each cerebral hemisphere. You have a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle. Your lateral ventricles on this image are located right below this C-shaped white structure called the corpus callosum. Everything is labeled, so you'll find it. You'll see the corpus callosum is this light colored C-shaped ring. And right below it is this little space. That space is the lateral ventricle. And then below the lateral ventricle or inferior to it, you'll see the larger kind of egg-shaped area, part of it, Part of that is the third ventricle. And then lower down, you'll see this little round pocket. It looks like a smaller brain. That's the cerebellum. And across from it, you see the beginnings to the brain stem or parts to the brain stem. And in between is a little pocket. That's the fourth ventricle. You find it between the cerebellum and the brain stem. Those are the four major empty pockets. And they're filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And you actually make the cerebral spinal fluid in all four of your ventricles. So all four of these ventricles have choroid plexuses to help make cerebral spinal fluid. And so your body will actually circulate this fluid. And to help track the flow, we're going to begin in the lateral ventricles. So let's say your choroid plexus and your lateral ventricles have made some cerebral spinal fluid. Where is it going to go next? Well, it's going to go down into the third ventricle. And it's going to be able to pass through things to a small little tunnel called the interventricular foramen. Your interventricular foramen helps to drain cerebral spinal fluid from the lateral ventricle into the third ventricle. And then once the fluid is, is in the third ventricle, you'll have to get to the, the fluid to the fourth ventricle. And you're going to do it again with another little tube. There's a long, small tube that will drain cerebral spinal fluid from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, and it's called your cerebral aqueduct. And so that's how you'll get it from the lateral ventricles to the fourth. Lateral ventricle through the interventricular foramen to the third ventricle, through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And then what? Well, after the fourth ventricle, you have an option. You can either continue down into the spinal cord or that fluid could leave and go and circulate around the brain. So after the fourth ventricle, there are two e exits. There's something called the median aperture and something called the lateral aperture. If you use the median aperture, that will send the fluid down into the central canal of the spinal cord. It will send it down into the little hole right in the middle of the spinal cord. But if you use the lateral aperture, that would send the fluid to circulate around the brain. Oh, but then what would happen? Do you just continue to build up this fluid? Because your choroid plexus is continuously making it. So is the fluid just building up in and around the brain and spinal cord? No. Your body's recycling this fluid. Turns out it pulled it from the blood. Remember in that choroid plexus, you pull that fluid out of the blood. Your body's just going to dump it back in. 
And you could see that in this image. There's these little cauliflower shaped buds, little mushroom shaped buds at the top of the brain in the image. If you were to zoom in, it's labeled. It's called an arachnoid villus, singular. Arachnoid villi is plural. Those are clusters of blood vessels that are going to reabsorb the fluid. So your body's just recycling this fluid. You'll pull it out of the bloodstream, send it through the ventricles, and then your arachnoid villi would reabsorb it and dump it back into the bloodstream. And then you'll repeat. So it's an easy order of flow. Starting with the lateral ventricles, pass through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle, pass through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, pass through the median aperture into the central canal of the spinal cord or the lateral apertures to circulate around the brain Well, you'll get reabsorbed by arachnoid villi and get put back into the bloodstream and then repeat. And that's the order of flow of cerebral spinal fluid in and around the brain. So now we could look at the brain. Now that we talked about all the things protecting the brain or circulating in the brain, now we could look at the brain itself. We're actually gonna start kind of from the inferior portions, the rostral portions, and work our way more caudally and anteriorly, more superiorly. So we're basically starting from the bottom and going up. And when you look at the brain from the bottom, it kind of looks like a little tail-like structure. It's what we call the brain stem. And when you look up close, the brainstem, like most things in anatomy, gets broken up. We break up the brainstem into three major parts. I want you to know the three major parts of the brainstem in order, either from top to bottom or bottom to top. On your slide, it's going in order from bottom to top. And you got to know the function of each part. So I'm going to go in the order of the slide. It's going in order from bottom to top. The bottom of the brain stem is called the medulla oblongata. The middle portion of the brain stem is the pons. And the top portion of the brain stem is called the midbrain. So that's the order from bottom to top. Medulla oblongata, pons, and the midbrain is the top portion. And that's what you're seeing in the image off to the right. You're seeing this long little tail-like structure at the bottom has what we call pyramids, these little projections. That's the medulla. Then move more superiorly. You'll see this large oval egg-shaped projection. That's the pons. And continue moving on up. You'll see a small portion uh, that has these small little clustered projections. We call them mammary body. That's part of your midbrain section. So we're going to go through all of these parts up close and look at them. And, but again, know them in order and stick to just their function. Remember, trust the exam review. So we're starting from the bottom and working our way up. So we're going to start off the last part of the brainstem. We're going to start off with the medulla oblongata. And so we already know from our spinal cord chapter, after the medulla, it will continue down as the spinal cord, acting as a highway of information for both motor and sensory information to and from the brain. We already know that spinal cord part. But we got to focus on the medulla itself. What is the medulla primarily responsible for? Well, it gives you a hint with some nerves associated with it. There are actually some nerves that come off the brain in this area. Remember, nerves coming off the brain are what we call cranial nerves. So this might actually help with lab, even though you do have lab videos, this might help. If you're trying to help identify cranial nerves, they're usually associated with cer certain areas of the brain. For example, though, when you're in the medulla oblongata, you're usually going to find your vestibulocochlear nerve and your hypoglossal nerve, usually in the medulla oblongata area. <clears throat> but there are other structures here. I mentioned in the previous picture, there is what we call the pyramids, the medullary pyramids. There are certain parts of the medulla that are going to help to, again, send information. Why? What information is the medulla responsible for? What information is it sending? Turns out your medulla is responsible for a lot of reflexes. Huh. Reflexes that people don't even realize are reflexes, like heart rate changes. When you're running and your heart begins to beat faster, you didn't tell your heart to beat faster. It 
reflexively did that for you. Same thing for your breathing rate. When you're working out, you reflexively begin to breathe faster. You don't forcefully force yourself to breathe faster. Your body was doing it for you. It was specifically your medulla. So things like altering your heart rate or your respiratory rate, that's your medulla doing it. Oh, there's other reflexes. A cough. If you're drinking water and your epiglottis so oh doesn't work right and it lets some water slip through, you're going to reflexively cough. That's your medulla. So there's lots of reflexes your medulla controls. Heart rate changes, respiratory changes, coughing, sneezing, hiccuping. These are all reflexes. Think medulla oblongata. So that's medulla. Then we go up higher in the the brainstem. And you see on this image, when you go higher in the brainstem, you're going to see an egg-like bulge. This is a key characteristic for this part. It's called the pons. You could always identify the pons because, to me at least, it looks like a little egg-like bulge in the brainstem. That is the pons. It is superior to the medulla and inferior to the midbrain. And again, it's like a highway for information, and there are going to be some structures associated with it. Again, cranial nerves are associated with some of these. Around the pons, you'll tend to find cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, and a part of cranial nerve 8. Uh, remember, cranial nerves, or you'll see later, cranial nerves have multiple names. Another name for cranial nerve 5 is the trigeminal nerve. Another name for 6 is abducens, 7 is facial, and 8 is your vestibular cochlear. So you tend to find these nerves around the pons area. But again, back to the pons. I told you it's sending information. Oh, what information is the pons sending and receiving? Well, your pons is going to send multiple types of information. Turns out one type of information your pons is going to send is motor information. It's going to send some voluntary skeletal muscle movement information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum. We'll see later, the cerebellum is going to help with some skeletal muscle coordination to kind of keep you coordinated so you're not all clumsy looking. And you're going to have to send that information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum. And you're going to use the pons. Your pons is basically a messenger between these other two parts of your brain, which we'll see later. And in in addition to kind of sending on this motor information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum, It could also help to alter your breathing patterns. Turns out when you do things like talk, you have to alter your breathing pattern. For example, when you have to say a very long sentence, you have to temporarily halt inhalation, then prolong exhalation. So you could say that very long sentence. And then when you're done with that sentence, you'll pause exhalation to do inhalation and take that deep breath. You're changing your breathing patterns and you're doing it with parts of the pons called the pneumotaxic and the apneuistic areas. They're helping you to kind of control your breathing patterns when you're doing things like talking. So your pons could help to send motor information between the cerebrum and cerebellum and it could help you to alter your breathing pattern with the apneuistic and pneumotaxic areas. And then one last part, or really the first part of the brainstem, the most superior part, is the midbrain. The midbrain is the most superior part of the the brainstem. It's superior to the pond. And like the other structures or other parts, it has nerves associated with it and other structures. For example, when you're in your lab portion, you could usually find cranial nerves three and four around the area of the midbrain. Cranial nerve three is also called your oculomotor nerve, and cranial nerve four is also called the trochlear. You could tend to find them around the area of the midbrain. And there will be other structures associated with the midbrain. But what is it doing? Like always, you got to know what's the function of this area. It's kind of just like the medulla and the pond. It's a relay station for information. It's a highway for information as well. So now what information is the midbrain carrying? Turns out, just like the pons, the midbrain also carries motor information. 
And it's also carrying that same motor information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum. But it sends it also to the spinal cord. So the midbrain could send motor information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum and the spinal cord. And in addition to sending motor information, it could also send sensory information. Remember, sensory information has to go up the spinal cord to the brain. And so as you're sending that sensory information up the spinal cord to the brain, you would use the uh, midbrain to help do that specifically. And the midbrain is going to send it specifically to another part of the brain we'll see later called the thalamus. Why? Well, it's helping to regulate certain types of sensory information. It's helping to regulate some sound, some auditory, and some visual information. So that's midbrain, or at least some midbrain functions. So relay centered sending motor information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum and spinal cord, and it's sending sensory information from the spinal cord to the thalamus. What type of sensory information? Think auditory and visual. So that's brainstem. And that's, so again, these are some images of the brainstem uh, to help you to identify some of these key features that were pointed out in the slide. No, I will not ask you to identify structures from the images in, you, in your lecture exam. Remember, trust the exam review. And I'm talking about a lot of these structures or parts of the brain as if they're their own unique, distinct structure. That's not quite true. Remember in anatomy, we love to name things, but these aren't necessarily distinct different structures. Why? Because this is mainly nervous tissue. This is just a whole bunch of neurons and neuroglial cells. And you know it's really the neurons doing the work. So sometimes when we name things, we might you might want to think it's a unique structure, but it's not. It's more of a network of these neurons working together. And this next thing is an example of it. It's called the reticular formation. Reticular formation is this particular highlighted area, but it's really a network of neurons working together. What are they doing? What's the function of the reticular formation? Very simply, it's helping you to maintain consciousness and it helps you to wake up. When you wake up, that's you getting conscious and you staying up is you maintaining the consciousness. You're able to do it with your reticular formation. So you could think if you've ever get a trauma to this kind of bluish purplish highlighted area of the picture, that's your reticular formation area, you might have difficulties waking up. You might slip into a coma and not be able to wake up. All right, and it's not really just a distinct structure. It's really more of a network of neurons working to kind of keep everything uh, conscious, working and functional. So that's reticular formation. And that's the brain stem. Again, the bottom portion, medulla. And that's all you're seeing in this table here, table 14.2. That's just highlighting the different areas of the brain stem. At the bottom is the medulla oblongata. The middle egg-like bulge portion is the pons, and the superior portion is the midbrain. So let's go on and talk about another part of the brain. Another part of your brain was this little small brain-like structure, more inferior. It's what we call the cerebellum, sometimes referred to as the little brain. It looks like it's almost a separate small brain underneath the larger top, which we'll get to later. But this is the cerebellum. And I'm just really going to go through some small anatomy, and I want you to focus on the physiology. But, but since we're looking at the picture here, what does it look like? Well, it's kind of like the higher, super, more superficial parts of the brain, where it's broken up into a right and left half, into what we call a right and left cerebral hemisphere. Remember that false cerebelli is running between these two cerebral hemispheres. But it's not completely cut down the middle. Because you can see there's still some cerebellum in the middle. It's like a little worm of cerebellum in the middle. We call the vermis for worm because it looks like a little, little worm. So that's some external anatomy of the cerebellum. But if we want to focus on the function. Oh, and on this slide, before we get into the function, they've cut open the cerebellum and you see a unique feature inside. You see some white matter inside the cerebellum. Looks almost like a tree. 
with branches. So we call it the arbor vitae. The arbor vitae is just this light area inside the cerebellum when you cut it open. You're just seeing white matter. You're just seeing where there's lots of myelinated neurons. But again, back to the function. So what is this doing? Let me give you a hint. Think back to when we talked about the brainstem. Remember, one part of the brainstem helps to send motor information from the cerebrum to the cerebellum. Huh. So you know it's going to have to do deal with motor information. Turns out your cerebellum helps with skeletal muscle contraction coordination, meaning it keeps you coordinated. How so? Well, you have to be coordinated to do things like walking. Well, when you walk, one leg mu has to have the muscles contract while in another leg, muscles need to relax and then you'll have to flip it. One leg is gonna have to dorsiflex while another plantar flexes, etc. This takes coordination. That's the job of your cerebellum. When you do things like close your eyes and touch your finger to your nose, or even if you look, if you look and you try to touch your finger to your nose, you're using coordination to do it. And that's the job of your cerebellum. So if anything happens to your cerebellum, you're automatically going to look really clumsy. Huh? What's something that could kind of disrupt the function of the cerebellum? What's something that can make you look kind of clumsy? It's alcohol. Oh, that's all that's going on. When you drink alcohol, all of a sudden, it's hard to get coordinated. You look clumsy. It's hard to walk. You lose your balance because you're affecting the muscle coordination center. You're affecting the cerebellum. And that's all police officers are checking for when they do a roadside test and they think you're maybe under the influence of alcohol. Yes, you could use a breathalyzer, but I could just test your coordination. How? Ask you to walk a straight line. It's going to be really hard to do it because you've affected the cerebellum. It's responsible for skeletal muscle coordination. So that's cerebellum. So again, we're just hopping from one place to another in the brain, talking about what they look like and talking about what they do. And we're now going to go on deeper into the brain now, into what's called the diencephalon. In this image here on the right, it's this central portion located under that C-shaped ring called the corpus callosum. That entire area underneath it is the diencephalon. Don't worry, we're going to look up close. And when we look at the diencephalon, like other parts in the body in anatomy, we're going to break it up. When we look at the diencephalon, we break it up into three major areas. The thalamus the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Now we're going to go through all three parts and talk about kind of a little bit what they look like, but we're going to focus mainly on what they do. Know the three parts and their functions, like usual. And we're going to go through each part one by one, starting off with the thalamus. This is the more superior portion, um, located superior to the midbrain. So it's this, if you look back at the previous image, it's more of that little dark egg-like structure. That's the thalamus in the picture. Same thing on this image here, this little egg-like blue structure. That's the thalamus underneath that C-shaped ring, underneath that corpus callosum. And what is this doing now? Um, again, think back. Uh, we have seen that you're sending some information to the thalamus. We're sending some sensory information. Turns out your thalamus receives and sends some sensory information. It's fine tuning some sensory information as it's making its way from the spinal cord to you, which is more of the cerebrum. So it's going to have to pass through the thalamus and it will fine tune it, kind of clean it up a little bit and then send it on up to the cerebrum. So it's just another relay center. And it helps to fine tune things. It's like a little pit stop for sensory information, for all your sensory information, except for smell. So any sensory information, except for smell, will have to make a pit stop at the thalamus before it goes on up to the cerebrum or what we call the cerebral cortex. There are lots of names for the cerebrum. Okay. You could call it the cerebrum, cerebral cortex, the cerebral hemispheres. That's all the higher portions of the brain. We're going to get there in a little bit. 
So that's the hummus. Sending all sensory information except for smell on up to the cerebrum. And then if you go more inferior and anterior to the thalamus, you're going to see a part, a part of the diencephalon called the hypothalamus. And that's what you see in this image. Again, kind of higher up, you see the egg-shaped oval, you see the thalamus, and they go down and anterior, and you see all these little clustered colorful areas. Those air clustered colorful areas in the cartoon are parts of your hypothalamus. It is inferior and anterior to the thalamus. And so what is the hypothalamus responsible for? Turns out it's responsible for regulating a lot of your homeostatic activities. It's highly responsible for helping the body to maintain homeostasis. You've seen by now a lot of, your th a lot of things in your body have to be at a certain level. And to help do that, you're going to use a lot of hormones. Turns out your hypothalamus has glands associated with it and it itself could release hormones that could help to maintain homeostasis. It's helping to maintain homeostasis. That's the hypothalamus. And then if you were to go inferior and posterior to the thalamus, you would find the epithalamus. It's inferior and posterior, uh, more, more inferior, I would believe, than superior, and posterior to the thalamus. And you could always identify the epithalamus because it also has a gland associated with it. The epithalamus has the pineal gland associated with it. And this gland makes a hormone, a hormone you might have heard before called melatonin. Huh. Turns out melatonin helps to regulate your sleep-wake cycles. Uh, what does it mean to regulate your sleep-wake cycle? Uh, or you might have heard it as set your body clock. It means the same thing. Uh, what does it mean to regulate your sleep-wake cycle or set the body clock? Well, it's just explaining what makes you sleep at night and wake up during the day. When you go to sleep at night and you wake up during the day, that's what we call your body clock or your circadian rhythm or your sleep-wake cycle. And it's thanks to your pineal gland and, and its production of melatonin. Turns out melatonin is what makes you sleepy. You're not really sleepy because you've been working all day. How do you know? We've all spent a day watching Netflix all day and we still got tired at the end of the day, even though we didn't do anything. So it's not really your level of activity. What really helps you to go to sleep is your pineal gland making melatonin. So at night, your pineal gland increases the production of melatonin and you feel sleepy and you go to sleep. And then during the day, when you open your eyes and light comes in, your pineal gland makes less melatonin and you'll wake up and you'll have energy to explore your day. And it's all in the area of your epithalamus. You can thank your epithalamus for making you sleepy at night and waking up in the day. And so that's the diencephalon. And again, like usual, we talk about a lot of structures, like they're unique structures, but they're not really. A lot of them are just networks of cells working together. Remember, at one level in this class, you're nothing but cells working together. And again, we see another structure here. It's called your circumventricular organs of the diencephalon. Your circumventricular organs of your diencephalon are just parts of the brain or in this case, the diencephalon, where you do not have a blood-brain barrier. So this is parts of your diencephalon where you're not protecting the nervous tissue from what's in the bloodstream. Oh, oh you would think that's bad, but you actually want this. This is a good thing. This is really for your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is missing some blood-brain barrier so it could see what's in your bloodstream. Remember, your hypothalamus has to maintain homeostasis and it helps to release hormones. And you remember, you have to release hormones into the bloodstream. So there's no, no barriers here to allow it to do that to help control homeostasis. And one example is alcohol. If you ever drink too much alcohol, you know, one thing that might happen besides you losing your coordination is you might vomit. Huh. 
you vomiting is your body trying to get rid of that extra alcohol. Oh, how did your body know you had too much alcohol? Well, it was your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus, because there was no blood-brain barrier, it saw the alcohol and then it uh, triggered a a stream of events to lead to you trying to expel it by vomiting. Circumventricular organs allow your body to check the bloodstream and maintain homeostasis. So that's diencephalon. And again, this table, well, table for uh, 14.2, are just showing the different parts of the diencephalon. And then we uh, go up higher in the brain, the more superficial part of the brain. If you were to ask someone to draw a picture of the brain, they will draw this superficial part of the brain we call the cerebrum. Remember, lots of the names for it. Call it the cerebrum, the cerebral cortex, or the cerebral hemispheres. Lots of names. It's just this outer superficial portion of the brain. And you could always identify it because it has some key features in it. And we're going to see that on this picture here. We're seeing this outer region of the brain. We're seeing the cerebral cortex. And I told you earlier on, your brain is cut in half. And you could kind of see that. There's a deep groove running right down the middle of the cerebral cortex. Uh, You remember in anatomy, we call deep grooves fissures. And this is a deep one going right down the middle. And so we call it the longitudinal fissure. It's what's practically cutting the brain in half, except for some central portions like the cerebral, uh, like the corpus callosum. That C-shaped ring we saw earlier is actually where your brain is still connected on the left and right side. But almost everywhere else, it's cut down the middle and you have this deep longitudinal fissure. What else? If you were to draw a picture of the brain, if you were to ask someone to draw a picture of the brain and they drew this outer portion, they always make it look wrinkly. When you look at the brain, it always looks wrinkly. Well, when you look at this outer wrinkly cerebrum, what you're really looking at is two things. You're looking at shallow grooves and the actual brain surface itself. That's what you're seeing in this small little picture off to the left. They've kind of blown up the surface of the brain and you kind of, we could kind of explain these wrinkles better. What you're really looking at are shallow grooves and shallow grooves in anatomy are what we call sulci, plural, sulcus, singular. So all those little lines you're seeing on the surface of the bigger picture off to the right are all the small shallow grooves. It's all the sulci. And then the actual brain surface itself, if you're actually to touch the brain itself, that's what we call the gyra, plural, ending with an I, gyra, and gyrus is singular. So if someone usually draws a picture of a brain, what they're usually drawing are all the shallow grooves, the sulci, and the actual brain itself, the gyrus. And then what else do we see when we look at the brain? Well, go on to this picture. The cerebrum is a pretty large area. And like most large areas in the brain, we're going to have to break it up. And when we break up the brain, we break it up into different areas we call lobes. I want you to know the first four major lobes on this picture. Be able to identify them. You see them color-coded on the picture. I'll explain it as we go through them and know their function. Know the lobes of the brain and their function. So what are they? There's the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and something called the insula. Uh, But don't worry about the insula. It's a little bit more complicated. So let's explain the first four. Oh, those, they all have names that sound familiar. Frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Oh, those sound a lot like skull bone names, cranial bone names. It's because they pretty, pretty, pretty much touch each other. The bone has the same name as the lobe because they both come into contact. So you kind of know where these lobes are based off the skull bones. You'll find the frontal lobe of the brain being protected by the frontal bone of the skull. You'll find the frontal lobe being protected by the frontal bone, etc. So you kind of could guess front from back. And let me help you on this picture here. It's pretty simple to tell front from back. How? The cerebellum, 
and the brainstem are closer to the back of the brain. So when you see this picture on this slide, you're seeing the small round cerebellum below, so closer to the left in this picture, that's back, and closer to the right, that's front. So in the front, in this light pink, you're seeing the frontal lobe. Behind it, posterior to it, in blue, you're seeing the parietal lobe, kind of towards the top of the head, that's more parietal lobe. In the back of the brain, in green, is the occipital lobe. And on the sides, in kind of fuchsia, pink, that's temporal lobe. It's pretty, these lobes are pretty much in the same places as the bones. And there's one more lobe. It's called the insula. You, to see this one, you'll have to peek between the temporal and the parietal and frontal lobes. It's nestled deep in the brain. So in this picture, they've kind of highlighted where the uh, insula would be. In real life, you'll have to kind of peek between the lobes because they're separated by fissures. There are grooves between the lobes, or at least the temporal and parietal and frontal lobes. You'll be able to peek in and see the insula. So now that you can find the lobes, oh, what do the lobes do? They all usually are responsible for different bits of information. We're going to pick simple uh, functions for these lobes. This is the brain. It's going to do a lot. We're just going to pick one major function for each lobe. Starting with the frontal lobe. A major function of the frontal lobe is to control or initiate motor activities. It's controlling the motor functions of the nervous system. If you want to walk to the door, it begins with your frontal lobe. It controls the motor functions. While your parietal lobe is receiving all the sensory information. It's handling the sensory functions. Remember as you're sending sensory information from the spinal cord, remember it has to make a pit stop and get fine-tuned in the thalamus, and then you're going to send it on to the parietal lobe. So when you touch a piece of ice and that ice feels cold, it's because you sent that cold information from the receptors in your skin to the nerves in your, uh, to the neurons in your nerves, to the neurons in your spinal cord, to the neurons in your brain stem, then the thalamus, and then the parietal lobe where you identified it as being cold. Then there's the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe also handles sensory information, but one specific type of sensory information I want you to know, it's, sense, it's hearing information. You can kind of think your ears are on the sides of your head for a reason. You're sending that, that hearing information from the ears on the side of your head to the temporal lobes on the sides of your head. That's why you have two ears because you have two temporal lobes, one for each ear. It's handling the hearing information. And then there's the occipital lobe. It's also handling a specific type of sensory information as well. Your occipital lobe handles vision information. So keep it that simple. Frontal lobe handles motor. Parietal handles most of your sensory information. Temporal lobe, specifically auditory. And the occipital, specifically visual information. And then, again, we could look inside, and we saw earlier in this chapter, first thing I pointed out was that the brain, just like the spinal cord, has gray and white matter. It's just that more in the brain, the, uh, the gray matter is on the outer portion, more superficial, and the white matter is deep inside. And we saw one particular white matter tract. You can see it in this image. It's that same image picture we've been seeing over and over again. It's this C-shaped ring deep in the brain. That's white matter. That's your corpus callosum. And it's actually helping to send information between the left and right halves of the brain, between your left and right cerebral hemispheres. Your left and right halves of your brain are actually usually handling different types of information, and they actually communicate with each other. So it's almost like you have two people talking in your head, and they're talking using the corpus callosum. But anywho, going on to other structures... Deep in the brain, very close to the, the diencephalon, is a cluster of, of neuron cell bodies. In anatomy, in the central nervous system, we call a collection of neuron cell bodies a nucleus. While in the peripheral nervous system, we call the collection of neuron cell bodies a ganglion. 
Well, some of these collection of neuron cell bodies are really important. We already saw in the spinal cord, there was the dorsal root ganglion handling sensory information. In the brain, there are some nuclei that are also important, like the basal nuclei. That's all they're seeing in this picture here. Your basal nuclei is just a cluster of collections of neuron cell bodies. There's usually three parts identified. You see them highlighted in the picture. There's something called the putamen, the globus pallidus, and the caudate nucleus. Those three clusters of neuron cell bodies are what we call the basal nuclei. They're also handling information, but again, trust your exam review. Stick to your exam review. So what do I want you to know? Well, I want you to know a different area in the brain. I want you to know what's called the limbic system. Your limbic system is just a, a collection of structures, a collection of neuron-based structures in the brain that are handling information. I want you to know the two parts of the limbic system and their function. The two parts of the limbic system, you can see in this picture, everything in green is really limbic system, but it's really two parts that are communicating. It's something called the amygdala and something called the hippocampus. The amygdala and the hippocampus are the two major parts of the limbic system. And what are they doing? Ah, what does the limbic system do? It's based off these two structures. Turns out your hippocampus is involved with processing a lot of memories. So a lot of your memories you could thank your hippocampus for. When you remember your fifth birthday and that little kid came to your birthday party and ate your cake before you got a piece and you got mad, well, you could remember thanks to your hippocampus. Huh. But what about the amygdala? Well, what's the amygdala doing? Turns out it's processing emotions like fear. Fear is an emotion. Turns out your amygdala, amygdala does it. So while you're remembering that little kid eating your birthday cake, you're using your hippocampus, and then when you're getting mad all over again because you still remember your mom told you not to cry, you got to let other people eat your birthday cake, you got super mad, that was your amygdala working. Uh-oh, Dr. Higgs, did somebody eat your birthday cake? Don't worry about it. All right. So that's your limbic system. Your limbic system handles memories and emotions like fear using the hippocampus and the amygdala. The hippocampus for memory and the amygdala for emotions. So like usual in anatomy, every structure usually has a function. So you've seen by now lots of different parts of your brain are handling lots of different functions. So when you think about those three major functions of the, of the nervous system, motor functions, there are areas in the brain that do that. We call them motor areas. When you think about the sensory functions, there are sensory parts of the brain that handle it. We call them sensory areas. And yes, there's that integrative function, that processing of information, those association neurons. You're doing that in what we call association area. So for every area in the brain, you're going to find a specific function. And that's all you're seeing on these pictures. These are just maps highlighting different areas. Like this first slide is showing you different sensory areas. For example, in your temporal lobe, number 22 is your auditory association area. That's where you're going to process a lot of that hearing information. While the green area, remember that's occipital lobe. Well, you remember there is that's handling vision. So you're going to see areas like number 17, your primary visual area to help you with that, to help you process that visual information. Remember your par parietal lobe does sensory information. So in your parietal lobe, you have what's called the primary somatosensory area to handle sensory information or your somatosensory association area. Every single part of the brain has an area to responsible for a certain function. Even same thing for motor, like what you're seeing in this picture. There are different areas to help with different motor functions. And you can see a lot of them are in the frontal lobe. Like in the frontal lobe, there is the primary motor area or the premotor area where you think about moving. It's all in the frontal lobe. So every part of your brain 
has a function. Even when it comes to processing information, that association function, that integrative function, you'll use association areas in the brain to help you to do that as well. And what else? There's lots of things to know about the brain. Remember, I told you your brain is practically cut in half into what we call a right and left hemisphere. And I told you, they don't even necessarily have to handle the same information. So when we talk about the left and right cerebral hemispheres, we talk about something called hemispheric lateralization. Each half of your brain is a little better at something else. Turns out the right half of your brain typically controls the left half of your body, while the left half of your brain typically controls the right half of your body. And not only that, certain information on average, remember all this information I teach you is based off averages, so don't feel bad if you don't follow this, but on average, they also process different information besides left versus right. For example, the left hemisphere from average studies has shown that it's really good at processing reasoning, numbers, science. Kind of think when you're taking your test in this class, you're probably using a lot of your left hemisphere. While on average, the right hemisphere has been shown to be a little bit more creative, more artistic, more uh, uh, magical thinking. It could come from more right hemisphere. So if you're more left hemisphere dominant, well, maybe this class might be a little bit easier for you. Or if you're right hemisphere dominant, maybe you need to try out and be on America's next uh, idol. All right. So again, these are averages. It's just based off old studies. And how do we even know this? Well, we know how nervous tissue works. You know this now. It's just your neurons sending information via electricity and chemicals. So if we want to see what something's doing, we could monitor that activity. That's what we do with when we monitor brain waves. You're literally monitoring the electrical activity. And so you could imagine if they were to put on electrodes on the, on the scalp to monitor electrical activity, and they put a person in a dark room, and they turned on the light, you would imagine you would see a lot of electrical activity in the area of the occipital lobe. Or if they put them in a dark room and they all of a sudden started to play music. Well, you would think you would see lots of electrical activity in the temporal lobe. Remember, if we know what the body does, we could take advantage of it. That's how we know this stuff. So that's a little bit on the brain. And to finish off this chapter, just like we did with spinal cord, we're going to look at some nerves coming off the brain. And the nerves coming off the brain are what we call your cranial nerves. Uh, we're, as we're going to go through this, like usual, stick to the exam review. But as we go through these cranial nerves, there's just basic things I want you to know. I want you to know, of course, your cranial nerves. For each cranial nerve, I want you to know, is it a purely motor nerve? Meaning, is it carrying pure, purely motor information? Is it a purely sensory nerve carrying only sensory information or is it a mixed nerve, meaning it's carrying both motor and sensory information? And then I want you to know the specific function for that nerve. So know the nerve, know whether it's motor, sensory or mixed and know its specific function. And like usual, there are, are tables to help. That's what you're seeing on these slides. Table 14.4, it's doing the exact thing I want you to know. It's showing you the cranial nerve. It's showing you whether it's motor, sensory, or mixed. And it's telling you the specific function of the nerve. But like usual, no worries. We're going to go through them one by one. Uh, uh, kind of helping you to identify the nerve and talking about all those things I want you to know. But keep it that simple. No, I will not ask you to identify a nerve by a picture. Okay, just know the nerve. No, Basically, know the name of the nerve. No, is it motor, sensory, or mix? And know the specific function. This table does it all for you. But we're, we're going to go through it all. And we're going to go one by one. And before I even go through them one by one, there's actually mnemonics to help you to know it. And it's, there's some mnemonics given in your textbook. You can see some on this slide, but I also have some mnemonics. For example, all, there are 12 cranial nerves. And all 12 cranial nerves, there's actually 12 pairs. You have 12 for each side. There are 12 cranial nerves coming off the brain on the right side and 12 coming off the brain on the left. 
and each pair has a name. And like most things in anatomy, it has more than one name. One way to name a cranial nerve is with a number. And it's in order from 1 to 12, but just to make this super hard because it's anatomy, they use Roman numerals. So just in case you don't know your no Roman numerals, as you're going through table 14.4, it's going in order from 1 to 12. So on your exam, you may see that I call a cranial nerve CN, and I'll use a Roman numeral. So CN in a single line is Roman, is Roman numeral one, that's cranial nerve one. So they have names, cranial nerve one through cranial nerve 12, and they'll use CN and the Roman numeral. But there's a descriptive name. They also have other a second name, a descriptive name. For example, cranial nerve one is also called the olfactory nerve. So I have a mnemonic to help you to remember the descriptive name. Like all my mnemonics, take the first letter in every word. It'll give you the first letter in the word you need to know. So here's the mnemonic, very similar to one to the one that's in your table 14.4. Mine is ooh, 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 to touch and feel velvet green vegetables are hairy. Okay, very similar to the one in your in your table. Ooh, 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 to touch and feel, velvet green vegetables are hairy. Say the first letter in every word gives you the first letter in the word you need to know. For example, the f O and O is for the O and O factory. Okay, so ooh, ooh, ooh is telling us the first three cr cranial nerves all begin with an O. So we're going through them one by one. That little mnemonic might help. And then you're going to have to know if that uh, that cranial nerve is motor, sensory, or mixed, meaning it's carrying both motor or sensory information. I also have another mnemonic to help you to remember that. Here it is to help you to know if it's motor, sensory, or mixed, meaning both. It's some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. And like usual, take the first letter in every word, gives you the first letter in the word you need to know. And this mnemonic goes in order of cranial nerve one through 12. So some of the words in that mnemonic begin with an S, that's for sensory. Some begin with an M, that's motor. And some begin with a B, that's meaning both. It's meaning it's a mixed nerve. And it's going in order from 1 to 12. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So according to that, some is the first word. So cranial nerve 1, according to that mnemonic, is sensory. And that's what we see in that table. So these two mnemonics are helping you with the first two things you need to know. What's the name? And is it motor sensory or both? And then you're gonna have to know the specific function. So if you actually know the specific function of the nerve, that alone will let you know if it's motor sensory or both as well. So take your time, but that's all you're doing. Know the nerve, know whether it's motor sensory or mixed, and know the specific function. And we're gonna go through them one by one. There are 12 pairs, we're gonna go through all 12. Starting off with the first, called the olfactory nerve. And it tells you in the name, actually, what it's doing. It's called the olfactory nerve because it's helping with olfaction. Oh, what's olfaction? That's smelling. So cranial nerve one, also called the olfactory nerve, helps you to smell. And smelling is a sensory function. So this is a purely sensory nerve. If you know the specific function, it actually also helps you to know whether it's motor, sensory, or both. That's it, cranial nerve one is a purely sensory nerve that helps you to smell. And you can see from this picture, it actually sits right above your nasal cavity. It's this long little yellow extension you see coming off the bottom of the brain. And it will send this extension ending as this round little bulb we call the olfactory bulb that sits above your nasal cavity. So when you smell, odors come in and they will touch receptors in your nasal epithelium that are connected to neurons that will pass that information on up into the olfactory bulb via the olfactory tract and olfactory nerve to send it to the brain to help you to smell. But again, lots of cranial nerves, keep going. Another cranial nerve is cranial nerve two, also called your optic nerve. Again, its name is giving you a hint. It's called optic for eye, 
because it's helping you to see. So cranial nerve two, purely, or also called your optic nerve, is a purely sensory nerve for vision. So if you were to see this nerve, you'll see it coming off the brain. It kind of forms this X. That's what we call an optic chiasm, is that center of the X. Then it will split into optic track or uh, optic nerve that will go to the eyeball. So you have two optic nerves, one for each eyeball, and they're helping you to see. So if you could go if you go blind, uh oh, it could be multiple pl- problems. If you could if you go blind, it could be an eyeball problem. It could be an optic nerve problem, or it could be an occipital lobe problem. So remember, if you know anatomy, well, it, well, it helps to explain stuff. Keep going. Then there's cranial nerve three. This is called your oculomotor nerve. And like always, it's giving you a hint of the name. Ocular for eye and motor for motor function. This nerve is helping you to move the eye. It's telling you in the name, oculomotor is moving the eye, all right? So when you move the eyeball around to look around, one nerve you're helping to you helping you to do it is oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three. That's one of the functions of this nerve. Again, lots of nerves, you gotta keep going. Another nerve is cranial nerve four, called your trochlear nerve. It is another motor nerve. You can see from the picture, this nerve also helps you to move the eyeball. So both cranial nerves three and four help you to move the eye. And while we're here, you see in the picture, there is one more nerve that helps you to move the eye. It's cranial nerve six. It's called your abducens nerve. So cranial nerves three, four, and six help you to move the eye. And I skipped over cranial nerve five. Well, that's what you see here. Cranial nerve five is called your trigeminal nerve. And you can see from the picture, it's a big nerve and it will split into branches. It will send a branch closer to the eye. We call that the ophthalmic branch. A branch closer to the upper jaw. So we call it the maxillary branch. And a branch closer to the lower jaw. We call that the mandibular branch. It's a huge nerve. And because of that, well, why is it so big? Well, it's because it's doing lots of things. It's a mixed nerve. It's carrying both motor and sensory information. Um, so what's the motor and the sensory? It has a hint with where it's going. Turns out your trigeminal nerve allows you to feel in your face. It's sensory to the face. So if you scratch your face, you could feel it thanks to your trigeminal nerve. It's sensory to the face. And it also has a motor function. Remember, it's a mixed nerve. It's also carrying motor information. It's carrying motor information to the muscles of mastication. Remember, those were your master and temporalis muscles, for example. This nerve helps you to chew. So cranial nerve five, also called your trigeminal nerve, is a mixed nerve carrying sensory information to the face for feeling and motor information to the muscles of mastication for chewing. Helps you to feel your face and to chew. That's cranial nerve five. And we already saw cranial nerve six previously. Cranial nerve six, also called your abducens nerve, is a purely motor nerve to help you to move the eyeball. So you have three nerves responsible for moving the eye. There's cranial nerve three, ocular motor, cranial nerve four, trochlear, and cranial nerve six, <clears throat> your abducens nerve. And then we come on down, keep going. There's cranial nerve seven. It's called the facial nerve. This is another mixed nerve. This is another nerve carrying both motor and sensory information. So what's the motor and what's the sensory? Again, picture kind of shows it's it's going to the face and also inside the mouth. Oh, what's going on? Well, first is this is the motor function, the motor. Turns out the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, is motor to the muscles of facial expression. Basically the muscles of your face. The muscles of the face are what you use to express yourself. Like when someone throws you a surprise birthday party with your own money, cause you're, you're, mo- you're the mom and they're the kid and they throw you a birthday party with your own money and you gotta fake like your surprise, but you knew it was coming cause you saw the charge on your, on your credit card. And you're like, oh my gosh, thanks. You're using your 
muscles of facial expression and you're using them thanks to your facial nerve. So it's muscle, it's a mo- uh, it's a motor, sorry, it's a muscles of facial expression. And then it has a sensory function. Ah, turns out, oh, you can see from the picture, it's going to the tongue. Turns out it's allowing you to taste, but not everywhere. You gotta know it specifically. Your facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, allows you to taste on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Your facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, allows you to taste on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So that's cranial nerve seven. Cranial nerve seven, AKA your facial nerve, is motor to the muscles of facial expression and it allows you to taste as the sensory function on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. But again, lots of nerves going on. Next up is cranial nerve eight called your vestibulocochlear nerve. This is a purely sensory nerve, but it's carrying different types of sensory information. It's carrying two major types of sensory information. And it's uh, kind of giving you a hint in the picture. You see it's a nerve going to some structures in the ear. Oh, it's associated with hearing. One of the sensory information your vestibulocochlear nerve is carrying is, sen- is hearing information. And it's carrying equilibrium information. When we say equilibrium here, it means balance. So you have some balance, you have some equilibrium, and it's thanks partially to your vestibulocochlear nerve. How do you know when you lose your equilibrium? What does it feel when it's, when when your equilibrium is disrupted, when it's, your balance is disrupted? You would feel dizzy. When you have dizziness, when the room looks like it's spinning, it's, you're experiencing what we call vertigo, and that's your equilibrium being thrown off. So that's what you will feel if this nerve, or one possible thing you will feel if this nerve were to be damaged. You will feel kind of dizzy. You will have an equilibrium problem. Or you might go deaf because it's also responsible for hearing. So I'm going to keep it that simple. Vestibulocochlear nerve, also called cranial nerve 8, is a purely sensory nerve carrying hearing and equilibrium, also called balance, information. That's it. Then next nerve is cranial nerve nine, also called your your glossopharyngeal nerve. This is another mixed nerve carrying both motor and sensory information. So again, what's the motor and what's the sensory? Well, again, this picture is helping us based off where it's going. It looks like this nerve is going again to the mouth and to the throat. Oh, this is motor and sensory. Uh, first up is the sensory. Turns out this is also going to the tongue to help you to taste. But again, we got to know it in detail. Your cranial nerve nine, your glossopharyngeal nerve, allows you to taste in the posterior one third of the tongue. So you could kind of think you taste with the front of the tongue, anterior two thirds with cranial nerve seven, and you taste with the back of the tongue, the posterior one third with the glossopharyngeal nerve. And you could also do some tasting in the throat as well because you do have some taste buds there and your glossopharyngeal nerve goes there. So you could taste in the back of the tongue and the throat. And then this is also a motor nerve. It's also providing motor to the throat to help you to do things like swallowing. So that's glossopharyngeal nerve. Cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal nerve, is a mixed nerve allowing you to have sensory information for taste in the posterior one third of the tongue and parts of the throat. And it's motor to the throat to help with swallowing. And then again, keep going. There's cranial nerve 10, also called your vagus nerve. Not Las Vegas, Vegas, not V-E-G-A-S, it's V-A-G-U-S, Vegas. That's your vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. And yet again, it's another mixed nerve carrying both motor and sensory information. But it's super simple and you just get a hint from the picture. You see, this nerve goes to a lot of your internal organs, heart, lungs, stomach, intestines, lots of your internal organs. Keep it this symbol. Vagus nerve 10, or vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, is both motor and sensory 
to your internal organs. It's motor, as in they could get, it's helping your heart to beat faster. Remember your sympathetic nervous system could get your heart to beat a little faster. And it's doing it with the help of the neurons in cranial nerve 10. So it could be motor. Same thing to your intestines. When you're moving food through your intestines, your uh, nervous system can help to speed it up or slow it down. You're going to use vagus nerve 10. And at the same time, it's providing sensory info. Think your tummy ache. If you have a tummy ache, you can feel the pain of your tummy ache. We call that visceral pain, thanks to cranial nerve 10. It's motor and sensory to your internal organs. Keep going, almost done. Then there's cranial nerve 11, also called your accessory nerve. Depending on your textbook, they might call it the spinal nerve or the accessory spinal nerve. Lots of names. Okay. Or you could just call it cranial nerve 11. And this nerve is a motor nerve. And you can see where it's going to. It's going to two muscles. It's going to your trapezius muscle in your back and your sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this muscle is helping you to elevate your shoulders, which is what your trapezius helps you to do. And it's helping you to turn your head, which is what your sternocleidomastoid does. But keep it this simple. Cranial nerve 11, also called your accessory nerve, is motor to a sternocleidal mastoid and trapezius for head turning and shoulder shrugging. And then there's one more cranial nerve. It's called cr uh, cranial nerve 12. It's your hypoglossal nerve. Your hypoglossal nerve is one more purely motor nerve. And you can see again from the picture, oh, it's going to the tongue. This is the nerve that allows you to move the tongue. It's motor to the tongue. So when you're talking and you're moving your tongue around or you're eating candy or eating period and you're using the tongue, you're allowed or you're able to move the tongue thanks to your hypoglossal nerve. Cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal nerve is a purely motor nerve to help move the tongue. So that's all your cranial nerves. Take your time, know the nerve, know whether it's motor, sensory, or both, and know the specific function. No, I will not ask you to identify them on a picture for lecture. Remember, trust the exam review. And then to finish off nervous system, uh, we just talk about kind of some development, some minor development. Like always, we talk about um, some what happens when you get older and when some things go wrong. So we're almost done. And some of this we already know. We're talking about some old development. Remember, your nervous system is just really at one level your nervous tissue. And you remember, your nervous tissue, like all your other tissues, started out from one of three basic embryonic layers. Uh, you got to think back to when you were a flat pancake. Remember, when you were a flat pancake, you were three basic layers. That's what you're seeing in the top picture to the right. You were something called ectoderm. That's what's in blue. You were something called mesoderm in reddish pink. And you were something called endoderm in kind of yellow. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that your nervous tissue came from the ectoderm layer. Same thing that we knew from when we did tissues. You got to remember it because we're still back in nervous tissue. So things about nervous tissue come back. I want you to remember nervous tissue comes from ectoderm. And that's the most detail. Yes, there are other developmental structures. Each part of your brain, we can identify its developmental origins, but we're going to keep it simple to the tissue range. And then to finish off, we talk about what happens when you get older and some things that could go wrong. And by now, you see, and it's not that good. As you get older, well, your cells get older. And when your cells get older, just like you, they will die. And it turns out the cells that are dying are the cells in your nervous tissue. It's your neurons. And when they die, you don't replace them. We, remember, your nervous tissue does not regenerate except if the cell body remains intact. And if a cell gets old and it dies, well, the cell body is not intact. So you don't regenerate nervous tissue. So when you lose neurons, that's it. And that's what happens as you age. You lose more and more neurons. And think about, think about that. You're losing the cells that are doing the work of the nervous tissue. So think about all the classes of neurons. You're losing motor neurons. 
So because of that, you're going to slow down because you're losing the neurons responsible for talking to muscles. So you'll see a slowing down of voluntary mus- motor movements because you're losing motor neurons. You're also losing sensory neurons. So you'll see there a degeneration in a lot of the senses like vision, hearing, sight. Just name a sense. You're going to see it deteriorate over time because, again, you're losing neurons. Again, continue. Remember, there are interneurons, those association neurons helping to process information. Well, you're losing those two. You're going to see a decline in the ability to process information. All because you're losing cells. Because just like you, your cells get old and they die over time. And you do not regenerate nervous tissue. And that's what happens when you get old. And then to finish off this chapter, like usual, we talk about some things that could go wrong. We talk about three things that could go wrong. Remember, trust your exam review. There's something called a cerebrovascular accident or stroke, a transient ischemic attack called a TIA, and something called Alzheimer's disease. So what's going on? First up is a cerebrovascular accident. You've probably heard it before by its other name. It's called a stroke. A stroke is when you have a disturbance in blood flow. Either you've blocked off the blood blood flow, you've caused an obstruction, or you've caused the blood vessel to pop. No matter what, you're no longer sending oxygen and nutrients to to the nervous tissue. And that's bad. It's called a stroke. If you're not sending oxygen and nutrients, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get a little delirious and you might lose consciousness and die. This is what happens to grandpa or grandma when they have a stroke. They're obstructing the blood flow or impeding the blood flow to the brain tissue and you're going to see a decline. Or you might see something called a transient ischemic attack, a TIA. You might have also heard it by its other name sometimes called a mini stroke. If you ever heard of the phrase mini stroke, they're referring to a transient ischemic attack. And if you call it a mini stroke, it gives you a hint. It's like a stroke. The major difference between a TIA and a, sh- a stroke, a full-blown cerebrovascular accident, is time. If your symptoms of your stroke, of that disrupted blood flow, last more than 24 hours, That's a stroke. But if the symptoms last less than 24 hours, well, it was a transient uh, event, meaning it came and it went away. That was a TIA. Maybe something temporarily blocked the blood vessel, a transient ischemic attack, and then it got loosened and went away and the symptoms went away. So if grandma or grandpa ever falls down and and all of a sudden something's not working, but it comes back in less than 24 hours, they had a TIA, still take them to the hospital because those are usually warning signs that a bigger stroke is going to occur. And then there's Alzheimer's disease. This is basically a neurodegenerative disorder disease, meaning the brain is basically atrophying, getting smaller. How? They're basically losing neurons. This is when they lose neurons over time. So if you were to look at a picture of someone with a normal brain and someone uh, with uh, Alzheimer's disease, you'd see that Alzheimer's disease brain is a lot smaller. It atrophies. It literally gets smaller because they literally lose neurons. So you would know what this looks like. It would look very similar to those basic signs of age. You're going to see a decline in motor movement because they're losing neurons. You're going to see a decline in information processing. So their memory is going to look a little hazy. You're seeing a loss in neurons. That's Alzheimer's. So these are some things that could go wrong with the brain. And this is chapter 14.